It's the World Cup of World Cups, Episode 7, Chile, 1962. Wednesday, the 30th of May, 1962, Benjamin Britten wows the brand new Coventry Cathedral with his war requiem. The final Soviet Cosmos satellite is on its way to orbit, and Acker Bilk is the first British artist to have an American number one. Meanwhile, in Santiago, Arica, Rancagua, and Vina del Mar, it's all kicking off. Los Fútbol de Chile is muy bueno. We're on our way to Gerald Sinstat. What a career that is. Played one, murdered one, never played again. Given over to open prostitution. We put that on the poster. If a swan can break a man's arm, a goose has got to be. He'll do your wrist in. <laughs> do you remember this voice? Get in the van! I'm just I checking. You've not got my wife in there. <laughs> you're going to lie, make it believable. There was a load of scuffles and then it was in danger of a football match breaking out. Make me bigger. Make me look massive. Dirty old Pele. Dirty, (laughs) cheating Pele. I mean, we're recording this over video conferencing software. We both have our bums out. Hola y buenvenidos a la Copa del Mundo 2. Copa del Mundo. Episodio 7. Chile. 1962. Mi nombre es Diego Cochinero y estoy acompañado como siempre por Pablo Salvaje. Hola Pablo, ¿cómo estás? Hola, bien, gracias. No usa en siete años, pero es muy oxidado, uh, which is, I've not spoken it in seven years, so I'm very rusty. We're going to be in the first World Cup in a Spanish-speaking country for 32 years, but four of the next five World Cups are going to be in a Spanish-speaking country. You'll have to practice. Get on Duolingo. But I hate that little owl. What's I hate that little owl in Spanish? No me gusta le owl pequeño. You've got until Mexico 1970 to learn how to say that. I hate that owl, butler. The answer to the teaser from the last episode... In 1958, Just Fontaine became the first of two African-born Golden Boot winners. Who was the other? The other was Eusebio Mm. of Portugal, but born in Mozambique uh, in 1966. So here we are in Chile. Now, South American nations had threatened to boycott the World Cup if it was going to be held in Europe for the third time in a row. And so FIFA relented and said, all right, fine. We can have it in South America. And the favourites to host it were Argentina. But Chile won the vote thanks to a man called Carlos Ditburn, who was a sports administrator who gave a really, like, stirring speech. Los fútbol de Chile es muy bueno. Los fútbol de Argentina, muy, muy mal. And everyone was like, <laughs> clap, 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 clap. Yeah. This guy's an amazing orator. <laughs> Sadly, he would not live to see the finals. I read this. He, he died like a month beforehand. That's right. Sad. He had a heart attack brought on by pancreatitis or possibly stress. It's quite a stressful thing to host the World Cup. Yes. Also because less than two years before Chile were to host the World Cup, the Valdivia earthquake, the largest ever recorded earthquake with a magnitude of 9.6, had hit Chile, devastated most of the country and killed thousands. So that changed things for this World Cup. They were going to have eight stadiums, but in the end, they only used four stadiums in four cities. Carlos Ditburn once said, Por que nada tenemos, lo haremos todo. Yep, tenemos, we. Por, for, something, all. So, something, we, all. Okay. That's how my Spanish works, is I pick (laughs) words I know. Does it work, though? No, it's Uh, really bad. (laughs) It means, because we have nothing, we will do everything. So they named the stadium in Arica after him. The other stadiums being used are the Estadio Sosalito in Viña del Mar, which is named after Viña del Mar's twin town, twinned with Sosalito in California. There's the Estadio Braden Copper Company (laughs) in Rancagua, which is owned by the Braden Copper Company, who in turn are owned by the Guggenheims. And there's the big one in Santiago, the Estadio Nacional, which would later go on to be used by General Pinochet as a prison and place where he executed people he didn't like. 
Oh dear. It's taken, what, all of four or five minutes to get to horrible right-wing politics? Point out, not in 1962. This is, no. you know, no, a decade later. Jumper. The stadium's still there, but now it's named in honour of Julio Martinez Pradanos, who was a sports journalist on Chilean TV. That's a bit like renaming Wembley after Barry Davis. <laughs> Do it, I say. Are you going down the Des Lynam? Yeah, I am. <laughs> We're on our way to Gerald Sinstadt. Um, 57 countries enter qualifying for 14 places we say hello to bulgaria who knocked out 1958 semi-finalist france and the other new boys Um, are can we have a little ding for that being our first womble (laughs) yes it is well done well spotted underground overground wombling free the wombles of wimbledon common are we the other new boys are colombia Notable absentees. Well, qualifying is still using playoffs instead of goal difference, which means finalists from 1958 Sweden are knocked out by Switzerland. We're missing half of the semi-finalists from 1958. Scotland are six minutes away from qualifying, but lose in a playoff to Czechoslovakia after extra time. South Korea win the sort of Asian qualifying section, and Morocco win the African qualifying section, including beating Tunisia on a coin toss. In those days, much harder to get a small Italian boy. Uh, we so will think, run oh, this reference into yeah, the ground, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's okay, too. So you think, okay, so Morocco and South Korea are going to be in the World Cup. No, FIFA make them play off against European teams, and the European teams win. So there is no Asian or African representation at this World Cup. Again, that happening, by the way, has huge repercussions on the next couple of World Cups. Ooh. Find out why next time. Is it because... Come on, lads. If you're going to have African qualifiers, you might as well have one guaranteed one. Interestingly as well, Ethiopia were in the European qualifying system. For some reason, Group 7 of the European qualifiers was a knockout tournament where Israel beat Cyprus, and then they had to play Ethiopia, and they beat them, and then they had to play Italy, who obviously beat them 10-2 on aggregate, and that was the end of that group. But that'd be Uh, hilarious if Ethiopia went as European winners, you're playing Tunisia, who are the African winners. They're like, I believe we're fairly close. Well, you know, if Wales can be the African representative in 1958... Ethiopia can be the European representative in in 1962. You'd think that Wales being the African representative would be banged on a bit more. uh... They keep very quiet about that. So the format is going to be the same as 1958, but first, goal average is now being used to differentiate any team's level on points. So there will be no more group playoffs. The final can go to a replay, but other knockout games that finish level after extra time will go to a blindfolded Italian boy. (laughs) They do the draw geographically. So pot one is the South American teams. There are two pots of European teams and one pot which has Mexico, Colombia, Bulgaria and Switzerland. I'm trying to think what the link is between those four. It's the rest. The ones we forgot to put in the other pots, I think it is. <laughs> and for the final time in World Cup history, all groups kick off simultaneously. There is no standalone opening fixture. Well, ooh, maybe we should get some kind of sound effect for lasts. Oh, yeah. We've got a bell for firsts. Like a hooter. Okay. All right. All right. If you could make that noise for every last, that would be <laughs> splendid. <laughs> Absolutely. So let's start with group one which features the Olympic champions, Yugoslavia, the European champions, the Soviet Union, Copa America champions, Uruguay, and Colombia, who are also there. So Uruguay, who have a current World Cup record of three appearances, two wins, and a fourth place. They beat Colombia, but lose to Yugoslavia and Soviet Union, so they're out. This is the worst Uruguay I've ever done to this point. Elsewhere in the group, in the Yugoslavia Soviet Union game, the Yugoslavian captain, Mohamed Mujik, breaks Eduard Dubinsky's leg. Apparently, now I don't know if this is real, because I don't know how the body works, but he broke his leg, and then <laughs> seven years seven years later, he got a sarcoma and died from it, which is like a form of cancer. And they reckon he got it from breaking his leg. Don't ding that! Sorry, I actually it's the. It. It's the first, person, the first person who died from an injury they got in the World Cup. I mean, keep that in. That's, <laughs> it's a bit... 
I was playing with the bell, was what I was doing. <laughs> but he um, he Bob Marley did. He got injured in a football match and died of cancer from it. That's what they say about Bob Marley, although that's disputed as well. Uh, yeah, because it's definitely not true. But also it is what Danny Baker did, that Danny Baker tackled him in an enemy writers versus musicians football match, went in too hard, kicked Bob Marley, his toe got cancer, and years later he died from it. So we're blaming Danny Baker for this one as well. As far as I can tell, they say the death was possibly as a result of the broken leg. That's all they can say. Yeah, I mean, that does sound like voodoo, essentially. I don't know how... Uh, the human body works enough to know whether that sound is bullshit. But, you know, in 1969, in 1962, Mujic isn't sent off for breaking his leg, but the Yugoslavian FA send him home after the game as a punishment. (laughs) They're like, well, if FIFA aren't going to do anything about it, we will. Yeah, yeah. And he'd never play international football again. What a career that is. Played one, murdered one, never played again. But it's not surprising that he didn't get sent off for that because Albert Dush the referee, is hit by Drazan Jurkovic and is not punished for doing that either. And you think, come on, referees, at least defend yourself. Also playing for the Soviet Union in midfield is Igor Neto. I don't think he's anything to do with the, the bargain supermarket, but he is nicknamed Goose because he has a goose-like walk, a goose-like head shape, and a hissing voice. So I like to think that he was probably actually a goose. I mean... If it waddles like a duck, looks like a duck, yeah. they played with an actual goose. Yeah. The other ones were Maverick and Iceman. And, uh... <laughs> he isn't the last a goose to play in World Cup football. Anyway, at one all in their game against Uruguay, Chislenko, and now I can't find any footage of this, but this is what the report says, Chislenko shoots, it misses just, but there's a hole in the goal net and the ball goes through that. So it goes where the side netting should be. Yeah, yeah. Get, it's not that the side the netting's side... not there. There's just a big hole in the side netting yeah, that yeah, a ball yeah. can fit through. That happens. And then the ball ends up in the back of the net, and they're ball like, in... well, obviously it was a goal. Well, the referee gives it, but Igor Neto says to the referee, no, it didn't go in. Disallow it. Aww. Well done, Goose. Well done. He was honking around, <laughs> saying you break his arm. Well, that's swans, isn't it? If a swan can break a man's arm, a goose has got to be. It'll do your wrist in. It'll stamp on uh, your fingers. And maybe seven years later, it'll kill you. Who knows? It doesn't matter anyway, because uh, Ivanov scores a last-minute winner and, and the Soviets win. And then in a delightfully bonkers game, Colombia are 3-0 down to the Soviet Union after 13 minutes and 4-1 down after 68, even though German Aceros, who is not German, He's Colombian. <laughs> he scores a baffling chip. I sent you the video. Did you watch it? Yeah, it's insane. There's like I don't know how he does it. Yeah, it's really weird. <laughs> yeah, because it's from inside the penalty area and it's over Leviashin. The striker, Aceros, is all sort of hunched over and the ball's almost behind him and he manages to chip it over Yashin into the goal. Anyway, Colombia a fall- little backswing either. Yeah, with heart with none, as far as I can tell. So they're four one down with like twenty minutes to go. Then, due to some comically bad defending, Marcos Coll scores direct from a corner, which is first time that happens at the World Cup, and so far only time that's ever happened at the World Cup. I've already forgotten what our noise is for last. <laughs> it was just sort of going. Mm-hmm. I think we should only have more for things that were bad because uh, I'd like to see more Olympic goals, as they are called. Do you know why they're called Olympic goals? I imagine it was just they were scored for the first time at the Olympics. Nope. <laughs> really? You'd, you'd think it, that, but that's not why. Uh, it was scored for the first time by Olympiakos? Nope. No, those are the two things I know about it. <laughs> okay. It's called an Olympic goal. This is so tenuous because the first recorded instance happened in 1924, but not at the Olympics. It was when Cesario Onzari scored one for Argentina against Uruguay, who were the Olympic champions. (laughs) Wow. That is tenuous. You could call it an Onzari goal. Yeah. Because he was the first to do it, very much the way we call the Penenka the Penenka, or we incorrectly call the Cruyff turn the Cruyff turn. Ooh. In fact, (laughs) no one has scored a goal direct from a corner at an Olympics until 2012. Who do you think scored it? It is a footballer you will have heard of. Jermaine Defoe. No, they're probably the top of their game. Messi. 
No, I'll give you another clue. They do it again nine years later at the Tokyo Olympics. Is it going to be like an American? Like, oh, it's going to be a woman. It's going to be... Come on, what are the American female players you know? Uh, Rapinoe, Megan Rapinoe. Yes, Megan Rapinoe, the only person to score an Olympic goal at the Olympics and has done it twice. I am so pleased I managed to dredge that from my brain. Like, that has genuinely been the highlight of my week. (laughs) Oh, dear, that says a lot about the quality of your life at the moment. Uh, So within eight minutes from being 4-1 down, it's 4 all. How long left to play? Well, that's it. There's no more goals after that. Colombia get their equaliser with four minutes to go. That would have been so infuriating. Unfortunately, Colombia then get beat 5-0 by Yugoslavia. Oh, disappointing, lads. So it was all for nothing. And that means that it's the two European teams that progress in that group. The Uruguayans are coached by Juan Carlos Corazzo, who is Diego Forlan's granddad. Their midfield consists of Pedro Kubala, who goes on to be... What do footballers go on to be, Paul, traditionally? Uh, Generally pub owners or coaches. Pedro goes on to be an artist doing paintings of Afro-Uruguayan candombi culture, tango bars and portraits. What's he called? Pedro Cubala. You can Google image search his paintings. They are pretty good. They've got a very distinctive style. Oh, yeah. I like them. It's a shame that he did something largely visual for this medium. <laughs> uh, oh, Google it in your own time. But it's nice. Yeah. Colombia are coached by Adolfo Pedernera. Interesting how many Adolfos there were pre-war and how we are running out of them now. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not a popular name, is it, Adolf, anymore? Adolfo is nicknamed El Maestro, as pretty much every South American manager is nicknamed. Yeah, it's either the Maestro or the Professor. But he was a brilliant player, but his peak was the early 40s which is the worst time to peak as a footballer because <laughs> there's no football. Group two is where it all happens. Group two have the hosts, Chile, two former champions, Italy and West Germany, and they have Switzerland. Switzerland just are no good. They lose all three of their games. It could be because their defender, Fritz Morph, is made entirely of plasticine. <laughs> <laughs> This group features the first Italy versus Germany game at the World Cup. Ooh. I mean, it's, it's West Germany, but Germany. And it finishes nil-nil. Notably more nil-nils in this tournament than there have been in previous ones. This tournament will set the record for nil-nils. That record is only broken in 1978. Right, let's go to Santiago for what David Coleman described as the most stupid, appalling, disgusting and disgraceful exhibition of football possibly in the history of the game. Chile versus Italy. This is the first time the two countries have met. We hope it will be the last. It is hilarious how awful this game. I'd gone into it assuming there'd been a war that they were on different sides of. And it turns out there was no war between the two. They just got pissed off by travel writing. Do you know what the offending bit of travel writing was? I looked it up yesterday. It's brilliant. I've got it in front of me. Basically, two Italian journalists called Antonio Girelli and Corrado Pizzinelli wrote that Santiago was a backwater dump where the phones don't work, taxis are as rare as faithful husbands, a cable... A cable to Europe costs an arm and a leg, and the letter takes five days to turn up. And its population is prone to malnutrition, illiteracy, alcoholism, and poverty. Chile is a small, proud, and poor country. It has agreed to organise this World Cup in the same way as Mussolini agreed to send our Air Force to bomb London. They didn't arrive. The capital city has 700 hotel beds. Entire neighbourhoods are given over to open prostitution. This country and its people are proudly miserable and backwards. Three stars. Also, breakfast was tepid. (laughs) In comedians at the Edinburgh Festival style, I think Chile should pick out the good bits of that. So they go, oh, they said, we're proud, given over to open prostitution. We could put that on the poster. There's only 700 hotel beds, but there's a neighbourhood entirely devoted to prostitution. Just go to one of the prostitutes' beds and be like, can I rent that for the night? I'll pay you. You don't have to touch me. I'll just have your bed. The Chileans don't take this lying down, unlike their open prostitutes. Their (laughs) newspapers fire back with saying that the Italians are fascists, mafiosos, oversexed, and because some of Inter Milan's players had recently been involved in a doping scandal, drug addicts. (laughs) 
there's basically like a roast battle between Italy that's, and Chile going on in the press. That's their pre-match warm-up, is to come on and just go, we're going to do some light stretchings, call your mother a whore, and then <laughs> say that you can't do basic infrastructure. Obviously, the journalists involved are forced to flee the country. In true angry mob style, an Argentinian journalist who has nothing to do with anything is mistaken for an Italian journalist in Santiago and is beaten up. Which is hilarious because Argentinian journalists also speak the same language as the Chilean mob and presumably would have been able to talk himself out of this, but was like, no, I'm just going to get punched in the face. So this is the build-up to the Battle of Santiago. There is a foul after 12 seconds. Surely a record. I think Vinnie Jones beat that record. I seem to remember he got a yellow card after six or seven seconds when he was playing for Sheffield United. Their irascible captain, Vinnie Jones, chose this weekend to revert to type. His booking after just five seconds was quickly followed by a goal for Manchester City. But never played in the World Cup, so we're not talking about him. After eight minutes, Giorgio Farini, nicknamed El Diga, which means the dam... As in is, the large thing that holds water back. Yes, that's correct. Rather than the damned. Anyway, he's sent off for a foul on Honorino Lander, but he refuses to leave the field. What if you do? If you send a player off and he goes, no, nope. <laughs> what do you do? Oh, it's n- not entirely voluntary. Get his teammates to take him off. Loads of police have to come on and escort him off. And I mean loads, like 20 police people. And the police are being called on, or the army, the police in fact. These police would have been Chilean police. If you've already insulted their country to the point that their footballers are giving you a kicking, probably go quietly with the people who have batons and possibly guns. Five minutes before half-time, Mario David fouls Lionel Sanchez, who retaliates by punching him. And Lionel's dad was a boxer, so he knew what he was doing. That was one of the neatest left hooks I've ever seen. And then as retaliation for that, David kicks Sanchez in the head, and then he's sent off. But not Sanchez. Oh, that was one of the worst tackles I think I've ever seen. Then there's a big melee. Yeah. And in that melee, Sanchez breaks the Italian captain's nose. Ooh. He's still not sent off. So that's Humberto Maschio. Maschio had been the top scorer in the Copa America for Argentina just five years earlier. It's Italy nicking players again. So once again, an Argentinian is punched by a Chilean because they think he's Italian. (laughs) There are scuffles all over the pitch for the rest of the game. There's spitting. The police have to come onto the pitch another three times. At one point, one of the players rugby tackles another. No, wow. And and for some reason, the referee then sort of jumps on. Bundle! (laughs) So you're probably thinking, who is this referee who's let this happen? Oh, he's probably from some kind of developing nation where football's not a thing. No, it's Ken Aston from England. Of course, whom Aston Villa was named after. Yes. Yes, that's correct. And who Ken, Barbie's husband, was modelled on. Because he had no visible genitals. Well, in this game, he hasn't got any balls. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> he was a high, widely respected referee, but after this, he never referees a World Cup match again. His wife, Hilda, invents yellow and red cards, but not for another six or seven years. I mean, it wouldn't have made any difference here. Ken's contribution to football, he adds the law about the air pressure in the ball. He invents substitute number boards and he invents fourth officials. So he had quite a successful career outside of this, apart from one game where he just lost it. Yeah. Was not able to control them. There's a phoenix from the flames from fantasy football with Badil and Skinner and Ken Aston talking about the Battle of Santiago, if you want to look it up. Anyway, Chile win the game, because there is a game going on. They win it 2 yeah. <laughs> There was a load of scuffles, and then it was in danger of a football match breaking out. So that effectively knocks out Italy, because West Germany win their other two games. There's a lovely diving header from Juve Sela against Chile. And in their game against Switzerland, a big defender from Switzerland, Heinz Schneider, scores an incredible volley, although it is in vain. One of those consolation goals that does not console you. The footage of the dead rubber match between Italy and Switzerland Switzerland starts with an Italian player in full kit apparently handing out Subway sandwiches to the crowd. That's what it looks like he's doing. I have no idea what he's actually doing. Hey, have you ever played a board game? You have? Then you'll love my book, 101 Board Games to Play Before You Die. 
I look at the board games that we've loved, hated and thrown across the room in a fit of rage. I'll tell you which classic games are not worth the time and emotional torment, and which games you should be playing instead, as well as giving you advice on how to make your dinner parties more tolerable and how to pimp your Scrabble. The perfect gift for your nerdy friend, it's available from 101boardgames.com. That's 101boardgames.com. So the Italians are out. Their squad features a couple of players who go on to manage Italy. Who? Cesare Maldini. Of uh, the sainted Maldini family. Father of Paolo. He, he manages Italy in 1998. Also Paraguay in 2002. Giovanni Trapattoni is in this squad as well. He managed Italy in 2002 and came within a Thierry Henry handball of getting Ireland to 2010. Still bitter about that, lots of Irish football fans, and as they are right to be. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Because of what happened to Italy in 2002 as well, arguably Trapattoni is one of the unluckiest World Cup managers ever. More about that when we get there. That's a little teaser for eight weeks' time. Their goalkeeper is Lorenzo Buffon. Of the family? He's the cousin of Gianluigi Buffon's granddad. The only game he doesn't play in is the Chile game, and he keeps two clean sheets in the others. So he's unlucky oh. to be knocked out. And Angelo Sumani, the striker, who was born in Brazil and therefore has the nickname the White Pele. He is the first of about 100 players who have that nickname. I'll flag him up as and when. Speaking of Brazil, into Group 3, which is where Brazil are, with Mexico, Czechoslovakia and Spain. That is a group of death. For who? Mexico, because they won't yeah. be as good. Pele scores as Brazil beat Mexico, and from the footage of it... He just decides to score. (laughs) He gets the ball just inside the Mexican half and just goes, right, I'm just going to run this in and no one's going to stop me. It's almost up there with Maradona's against England. However, against Czechoslovakia, he injures his groin and is out of the rest of the World Cup. The Czech defenders, Jan Popluha, who's very Popluha, and Jan Lala, (laughs) see him clearly injured on the pitch and refuse to go in tackles with him. Oh, that's... No, we're not going to tackle him. He's very sweet. Yeah, because remember, there's no substitutes still. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. That's very, very sporting. Yeah, in fact, Jan Popluha is awarded the World Fair Play Award for doing that and also for bringing the referee's attention to Pelé being injured. How very sporting in a tournament that is the opposite of sporting. Just as a side note, Brazil's team doctor is called Dr. Hilton Gosling. <laughs> He sounds like he should be in an episode of like The Young and the Restless or something. <laughs> Dr. Hilton Gaslin, attorney at law, and then just like zooms off in a in a Lamborghini Countach. As well as Pele being out, Brazil are missing a, another couple of players through injury. Pepe, he was supposed to play in 58 and 62, but was injured just before each one. So he missed oh. out and never played. He once joked that he was the greatest Santos striker on the planet. Because Pele is from Saturn. (laughs) Oh, that's very nice. Yeah. They bring in Amarildo, their fourth choice striker, nicknamed O Possesso, which means the possessed. Oh, right. So he'd been doing seances. I mean, if you're the fourth choice striker and you manage to get onto the pitch, there's got to be some hoodoo voodoo sacrificing cockerels at the crossroads at midnight. There's got to be something. He could turn his head around 360 degrees. And <laughs> like an owl. Very controversial opinions about where your mother is. So he, he comes in for Pele. Interestingly, in 1963, Everton tried to sign him, but the FA won't let them this is yeah. because the FA have still had their stupid no foreigner rule. He goes to AC Milan instead. In the game against Spain, he scores twice as Brazil come from behind to win. Spain, by the way, now have Puskas in their team. I don't quite know how that worked. Was he exiled or did he he just not get a flight home when it first all kicked off and went, I'm just staying out? He was out of the country at the time of the revolution and Mm. was playing for Real Madrid and just went, I'm Spanish now. (laughs) That's me done with communists. So Brazil go through, and then the other teams all beat each other. Confusing. Czechoslovakia getting a draw with Brazil means that's enough for them to go through in second place. Even though they got beat by Mexico. It's the first time Mexico have done a thing. They've been to loads of World Cups, and the first time they've done something. 
Yes, they've won a game at a World Cup. Yay. First time Mexico have done it at their 14th attempt. They'll be dancing on the streets of Guadalajara. In the game, Vaclav Masek scores after 15 seconds for the Czechs and puts them 1-0 up. That's the fastest goal so far at the World Cup, and that's a record that's going to last for another 40 years. However, Mexico hit back, and when Alfredo del Aguilla puts them 2-1 up after half an hour, it is the... F- First time Mexico have been in the lead in a World Cup game. (laughs) This is what happens when you have somebody who wants to play rather than somebody who is sad that you can't get chalupas. I have had a look and I cannot find evidence of statues for the players who score in this game. They won a game. I mean, they gave a statue to the guy who scored in a draw, but I don't (laughs) think for the, the guys who scored in the win. They lose to Spain, though. Antonio Carvajal, their goalkeeper, who's in his fourth World Cup at this point, he says he's going to retire from international football, having not kept a World Cup clean sheet in 11 games. You'd imagine that that decision would have been made for him. I'm going to retire. Yeah, you should have done. They're coached by Ignacio Trellis, who lived to be 103. Is that our oldest ever... Yeah, I think so. I think he's the oldest ever World Cup-related person. Ignacio Trellis, the coach of Mexico in 1962. Who also invented the trellis. (laughs) Yes, he did. Spain are also out. This is some Spanish team, by the way. They're coached by Helenio Herrera, who was one of the first sort of auteur managers, you know, stamped their own identity on how the team played and everything. While managing Inter Milan in the mid to late 60s, he suspended a player for telling the press we came to play in Rome instead of we came to win in Rome. (laughs) He'd also send club officials to players' homes for bed checks. No further information on what they were checking for. I'm just checking. You've not got my wife in there. (laughs) (laughs) Why in my bedroom? Just checking the beds, that's all. Just checking the beds. (laughs) So Spain finished bottom of the group despite having nicked Puskas and Jose Santa Maria who had played for Uruguay in 1954 and who would go on to manage Spain in 1982. And on the subs bench, they have an injured Alfredo de Stefano. Who is uh, widely regarded as one of the greats of all time. But this is the problem with World Cups being only every four years. It's not a problem. It's a weird wrinkle that sometimes the best players in the world aren't hitting their peak at those times. He was in the squad, though, so we can talk about him. Di Stefano, twice Ballon d'Or winner, scored in five consecutive European Cup finals including a hat-trick in the 7-3 win over Eintracht Frankfurt. He never played in a World Cup. A year after this, he is kidnapped by a group of Venezuelan revolutionaries in Caracas. Were they over there for a friendly or just he was on holiday? Yeah, Real Madrid were uh, touring. After two days, he is released completely unharmed with no ransom having been paid. And the next day, he plays against Sao Paulo. Like it's nothing. That is one of five stories that features in the film Real La Pelicula, Real the Movie, uh, which came out in 2005 and has an IMDb rating of 6.1. And one of the reviews on the IMDb is entitled, Good If You Like Real Madrid. (laughs) (laughs) If you like Barcelona, it's a tough watch. Yeah. They have a premiere for the film. In 2005, Di Stefano is at the premiere. Also at the premiere is Paul Del Rio, who was one of the kidnappers. <laughs> I was just about a joke. <laughs> also at the premiere was the kidnappers. They actually brought the kidnappers along. Like, this is your life. Just being like, yeah. do you remember this? It's a slice of your ear that we sent in the post. Do you remember this voice? Get in the van! <laughs> it's my old friend, Paul. <laughs> In 2013, a year before Alfredo de Stefano died, his six children prevented him from marrying his secretary, Gina Gonzalez, who was 50 years younger than him. You dirty dog, de Stefano. Let him have his fun. Yeah. He was kidnapped once, you know. (laughs) Anyway, the repercussions of Spain constantly nicking players and Italy is after this World Cup, FIFA bringing a rule saying you're not allowed to switch countries if you've played a World Cup game including qualifiers. The only exception is for, like, newly formed nations. 
Then so yes, right. if you played for West Germany, you are then allowed to play for Germany as yeah, yeah. Uh, or when the Balkans split up. Yeah, I think like the next players to do it are Prozanecki and someone else who do it for Croatia in the nineties. Yeah. The Spanish squad also include Eulogio Martinez. He was a centre forward, played for Barcelona. He scored the first ever goal at the Camp Nou, and he once scored seven in a game versus Atletico Madrid. He should be more famous than he is. Oftentimes with these things, where you go. Why have I never heard of this guy? I sent you a, a link to a bit of footage of him playing for Barcelona against Wolves. Yes. Do you see what he does in that footage? Oh, he's the man who does the Cruyff turn before the Cruyff turn exists. He does the Cruyff turn. He, I think it's the first recording of someone doing it. So he's the possible inventor of it. It should be called the Martinez turn. Sadly, Martinez was hit by a car while changing a flat tyre in 1984. As we head into the 60s and 70s, loads of footballers die in car accidents. Really? They've all offended the royal family in some way, allegedly. (laughs) I've become a bit obsessed with how footballers die. And (laughs) car accidents is way up there. Anyway, into Group 4, which features Argentina, Bulgaria, Hungary and the brave boys of England. Oh, plucky lads. Hungary play England in a downpour. And Hungary win 2-1, and that is the last time they beat England until June 2022. Then Hungary wallop Bulgaria 6-1. Florian Albert gets a hat-trick. More about him later. You start thinking, oh, blimey, the glory days of Hungary are coming back. Lachos Tiki scores against England and twice against Bulgaria as well. He's possibly the most prolific goal scorer ever. Look, a lot of these figures are disputed. Pelé famously scored over 1,000 and Romario claimed that he'd scored over a 1,000 goals. But yeah. they were like, you've included friendlies in this. I scored them. They count. You've included kickabouts in the back garden, which might have happened in Tiki's case because, allegedly, he scored 1,912 goals in 1,301 games. Allegedly, in 1959-60, in an 85-game season, he scores 201. It's just, it's just not believable. If you're going to lie, make it believable. This is uh, Kim Jong-un's getting 17 holes in one in the first round of golf he ever played level of believability. Yeah, yeah we won't say 18. People won't believe that. We'll say 17. Yeah. Then we've got the first World Cup meeting of Argentina and England. England go 3-0 up, thanks to a Ron Flowers penalty. Ron Flowers, you know when we were saying what do footballers do after... Do you know what Ron Flowers did? Tell me. Ron Flowers opened a sports equipment shop in Wolverhampton, where I grew up, and was the sole supplier for all of our PE kits. So if you wanted the St. Peter's School PE kit, you had to buy it from Ron Flowers Sports Stop in Codsall. Amazing. Did you get to meet Ron Flowers? No, no. But when I read that, I went, he's got the same name as the PE shop from a, what? Yeah, it's that guy. He scored six out of six penalties for England. His sister-in-law, Maureen, was a darts world champion. Put that in the Real Madrid film. The other goals for England were scored by Bobby Charlton and Jimmy Greaves. Argentina pull one back with 12 minutes to go. And then Argentina hold Hungary to nil-nil. All of that means that England just need a draw with Bulgaria to go through on goal average. The game is described by Bobby Moore as one of the worst internationals of all time. (laughs) (laughs) And finishes nil-nil. And England are through by drawing nil-nil again. So into the quarterfinals, which for some reason, they're still doing them all at the same time. Because TV rights haven't been invented yet. Yeah, I mean, these games are televised, but the TV companies have to pick one. Well, also when David Coleman said, oh, this is the stupidest game of football that's ever existed... It was two days later because they literally sent the films back. Uh, They flew them back. They had to wait for the video to arrive. Chile beat the Soviets 2-1. Old Punchy Sanchez opens the scoring, beating Yashin at the near post from a free kick. Rojas scores a worldie from 30 yards for the winner. The game is refereed by Leopold Horn who's keeping an eye on the Chileans after what happened in Santiago. Leopold had fought in the Dutch resistance in World War II, was a black belt in judo. And was putting up with none of their shit. Of people to not put up with shit, I would say a black belt in judo uh, resistance fighter is probably quite high up there. He also once threw his whistle at Puskas. (laughs) Who then took it on the chest, volleyed it, (laughs) put it straight back into his mouth. Czechoslovakia are playing Hungary. Czechoslovakia, who've been beaten by terrible, terrible Mexico. And Hungary, who are 
beaten England and, and scored six and, you know, our glory days are back. And obviously the Czechoslovakians win. Yep. It's a shock, guys. The Hungarian squad also includes Erno Solimosi, a defender who, after he's a footballer, he becomes the personal guard of the communist leader of Hungary. That's cool. That it was that just... running a sports shop in Wolverhampton. It'd just be like you going... You know what? I'm dictator of the country. I want my favourite player to hang around me. Yeah, I want Ian Taylor to be my personal guard, please. <laughs> Yugoslavia play West Germany in a World Cup quarter final for the third World Cup in a row. And this time, Yugoslavia win. They win 1 0 with a goal five minutes from time from Petar Radokovic, who four years later dies of a heart attack while training, which is very, very sad. But he had long-standing heart problems, and he'd been told by doctors not to train, and he ignored them. If you're told not to train, that's a great excuse as well, to be just like, sorry, can't. A national hero in Yugoslavia, 15,000 people going to his funeral. The West Germans, who are out, feature as an unused squad player, Heinz Volmar, who's notable because I think he's the only player to show up at a World Cup who had once played for Saarland. Our favourite little nearly qualifiers from the... Um, yeah, from 1950, they, I think. Yeah, 1950. They only existed for four years or something. They have Willy Geisman in defence, who would sadly have his international career ended in 1965 when his shin bone was broken by Pele. Dirty <laughs> old Pele. Dirty, 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 cheating yeah. Pelé. And West Germ squad also featured the midfielder, Horst Zemaniak, a maniac on the floor, and he's dancing like he's never danced before. <laughs> <laughs> but the exciting quarterfinal in 1962 is Brazil versus England. It's the first meeting of Brazil and England at a World Cup. It is in the mist at Vinha del Mar. Garincha opens the scoring before the equaliser for England. Do you know who equalises for England in this game? Is it Ron Flowers Sports Shop? It isn't. It is someone who was born in Rowley Regis, though. No. Keep the Midlands theme. Jerry Hitchens. Have you heard of him? No. He played seven games for England and scored five goals. What? Like, that's better than Jimmy Greaves' numbers. And it should have been much, much more. But there's a reason why it wasn't. It's because he was playing for Inter Milan. And he's the first overseas-based player to play for England. And uh, after the 62 World Cup, Alf Ramsey comes in as manager, and he just didn't like it. He was notoriously yeah. xenophobic, Alf Ramsey, and didn't like, he didn't really? like that he... Yeah, didn't like that Jerry Hitchens played in Italy and just wouldn't pick him. Hitchens played in Italy for another nine years, had a very successful career over there. He died playing in a charity football match in 1983. When he was hit by a car? No, no it was a charity football match. Paul, he was not hit by a car. Not every footballer is hit by a car, just quite a lot of them. Just have to check. Uh, in the second half, the English goalkeeper, Ron Springett. What a name. No one's called Ron Springett anymore. Yeah, it's a shame he wasn't like a speedy winger or something, because that would be like what he did to the offside trap. Yes. Spring it. But he's only five foot ten. Garinch takes a free kick. And spring it just, I don't know what he's trying to do. I think he's trying to pick the ball up. But what he actually does, he just, he sort of scoops the ball into the air and Vava heads it in. Yeah, it's a bizarre goal. And then six minutes later, Garincha scores a wonder strike. It's a beautiful goal. Yeah, no goal group in the world's stopping that. But then there's a first, I think. A dog gets on the pitch. <laughs> Although the commentary on the clip I've seen refers to it having happened in Rancagua earlier in the tournament, although I can't find any evidence that it did, but if he's saying it, it must have. And again, we've got a little a black dog on the field, rather larger than the one we had at Rancagua. And Mr. Mr. Swint of France, the referee stopping the play until we remove the dog. This is the first dog on the pitch that we know of. Let's say that. <laughs> First of all, Spring It tries to get it and the dog's having none of it. Then the dog runs away from Garincha. And, Through his bandy uh, legs. Yeah. And then Jimmy Greaves gets down on all fours. <laughs> and the dog is sort of confused by that, sort of wanders over to him. And when he does, Greaves sort of grabs him and picks up the dog. Well done, Jimmy. Jimmy Greaves already the hero at this game. But the dog obviously not like being sent off the field so early. And then the dog 
pisses all over Jimmy Greaves. <laughs> um, Marking him forever as uh, yeah. that dog's territory. Yeah, that, uh, that, Jimmy Greaves now technically belongs to that dog. Because they don't have a change of shirt. It's 1962. He just has to play on smelling a dog piss. Uh, Grincher thinks it's so funny that he adopts the dog. <laughs> And also Jimmy Greaves. <laughs> yeah, as a result. And also, the bit the, where you swap uh, shirts at the end. Just everyone yeah. being like, I'm all right, yeah, you're, thanks. You're right. You're all you're right, Jimmy. Jimmy. You keep that one. And depending on who you believe, Garincha either names the dog by, meaning... That he sleeps with men and women? No, because by Campeos, two times champions. All right. It's short for that. Or he calls it Greavesy. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what Jimmy Greaves said. Uh, this will be about Jimmy Greaves. He scored 44 goals in 57 games for England. Just he, a ridiculous he, amount. He is, has a shout of being England's most natural striker. But also he said it wasn't instinctive. He said that it was, he did the maths and was like, if I get into the box 10 times a game, I'll get a cross into me seven times a game. Three times out of that, I'll be able to get shot away. And one time like that, I'll be able to score. So I've just got to get in the box more. Gary Lineker, years later, would say that he was never in the right place at the right time. He was in the right place all the time. He scored six hat-tricks for England, which is still the record. Harry Kane has five. So just waiting for a time when England get three penalties in a game for him to equal that. He holds the record for the most goals in a top division. He scored 357. He was transferred to Spurs from Chelsea for £99,999. Do you know why that figure specifically? Uh, Is it to deliberately not break the record? It did break the record. He was the most expensive English player. Is it something to do with maximum wage? (laughs) <laughs> no, it was because the uh, the manager didn't want Jimmy Greaves to have the pressure of being the first hundred thousand pound player. It's like it's only one pound. Yeah, yeah, it's like so you know if he misses a chance, it's like well he was only ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine pounds. It's not like he was also like there is that pounds. weird thing of uh, nineteen ninety nine feeling so much cheaper than twenty quid. He just felt like a bargain all the time. In 1974, he ran as a Conservative candidate in a council election in Havering. He didn't win. He was the TV reviewer on TVAM in the 80s and, of course, co-hosted St. Greavesy on Saturday lunchtimes during my entire childhood. So yeah, just, I used to just remember St. Greavesy. Just remember eating bacon sandwiches and watching them laughing about football. That's a shock, isn't it, folks? <laughs> that is a shock. <laughs> He also entered the London to Mexico rally in 1970 in a Ford Escort and came sixth out of 96. Well done, Greavesy. England are out. Another disappointing quarterfinal exit. Their squad included Jimmy Armfield at right back. He played all of his career at Blackpool. There's a nine-foot statue of him outside Blackpool's Grand. Nice. (laughs) Make me bigger. Make me look massive. He was a pipe smoker. He was the voice of BBC Radio coverage for years and years and years. I was like on the Radio 5 live coverage where they'd throw to Jimmy Armfield at Anfield. He got a job in the 90s working for the FA, appointing England managers. Ooh. It was he who appointed Terry Venables in 1993. And after Venables left, he was asked, who do you think should be the next England manager, Jimmy? And he said, there is only one man for the job, and that's Kevin Keegan. So anyway, he appointed Glenn Hoddle. <laughs> <laughs> George Eastham is in the squad. He's significant because he took his team, Newcastle United, to court for restraint of trade. It led to an overhaul of the transfer system in England. He was basically the bosman of his day. Well, because the transfer system was quite weird and quite broken. Also, the maximum wage was still a thing at that point, wasn't it? Because one of the Wales players, Len Ford, I think it was, should have gone to the 58 World Cup, but he was banned because he'd been admitted in his autobiography that he'd been taking payments above the maximum wage, which apparently everyone did. He admitted it and uh, got banned from the World Cup for it. Actually, the maximum wage was ended in 1961, so it was the year before. Uh, Also in the squad was Peter Swan, centre-half, who in Who was a real swan. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, we had a goose and now he's this one. No, he'd be banned from football for life in 1964 for betting on his Sheffield Wednesday team to lose to Ipswich. He went to jail for four months and the life ban was lifted in 1972, but he was too late by then. Can't carry on. Yeah. And Jimmy Adamson was in the squad. He was 33. He just won player of the year. 
And he was a sort of player slash assistant manager for Walter Winterbottom. Winterbottom stands down after this World Cup. And the FA's first choice for manager is Jimmy Adamson. But he turns it down to manage Burnley. Because it's so much more stable. Yeah, which is why England get Alf Ramsey instead. So Jimmy Adamson turns that down, which means Alf Ramsey becomes England manager, which means Jerry Hitchens never plays for England again. I'm Paul Savage, as well as being the co-host of the World Cup of World Cups. I am a stand-up comedian. I'm doing a show called Well Groomed at the Cannons Gate during the month of August, from the 6th to the 28th, not the 17th, at 4.30 every day. A fun, silly show about trauma. And I am also a cartoonist. I have a book called But Doctor, I am a collection of comic strips by Paul Savage, and it is available through my website, savagecomic.com, along with mugs, stickers, postcards, and other fun stuff. Please check those out. Into the semi-finals, the two teams who basically no one thinks should be in the semi-finals play each other. The Czechs beat the Yugoslavs 3-1. Adolf, another Adolf, Adolf Shearer. (laughs) We've all got the same mental image now, haven't we? (laughs) I mean, it's not spelt the same. Adolf Shearer, he scores two in the semi-final. Running away with one hand outstretched, but in a slightly different way. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. In 1973, he defects to France. So the Czech authorities erase his name from all official records and statistics. But he did. He scored two goals in the semi-final. You can't take that away from him. He is still in the south of France. How many people do you think were at this World Cup semi-final? Uh, World Cup semi-final, so like 95,000. 5,890. The reason it was so low is because at exactly the same time in Santiago, it was the semi-final between Chile and Brazil. Yeah, so that would have just been people who couldn't get a ticket and wanted to not listen to it on the radio. Uh, That game is the biggest crowd of this World Cup. It's bigger than the final. Uh, 76,594, which is more than 20,000 more than the aggregate attendance of all Czechoslovakia's games put together. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So it's Chile-Brazil in the semi-final. Garincha scores two of which the first one is the best. Uh, it's then, like Garincha was a really, really amazing player. He is good at football. Toro pulls one back to make it 2-1 at half time. Three minutes into the second half, Vava scores. Then old punchy Sanchez scores a penalty before Vava gets his second, makes it 4-2. It's not without controversy, though. Lander is sent off for fouling Zito, and Garincha is sent off for kicking Rojas. He was there to kick Rojas and take names. On his way off the pitch, Grincha is struck by a missile from the crowd and cuts his head. So Grincha has been sent off in the semi-final, Paul. What a shame he's going to miss the final. No, nope. Brazil successfully negotiates to let him play in the final. The justice system works, I guess. The third place playoff is massively forgettable. Uh, Eladio Rojas scores in the last minute to give Chile a 1-0 win. It's Chile's best ever World Cup and Yugoslavia's joint best ever World Cup. There's a thing on the 62 page that says, oh, it was the best performance by a South American team apart from the ones who'd already won it. And I was like, shut up. That's a really stupid way to say that. The Yugoslavian squad featured their reserve goalkeeper, Gordon Arevich, who was nicknamed Kamikaze for throwing himself at attackers. Dragoslav Sakalerak, attacking midfielder, who was known as El Pele Blanco. (laughs) Another white Pele. Juve tried to sign him, but the communist government of Yugoslavia stopped it because they said that Dragoslav was needed to entertain the working class. Well, if you're not getting Football Italia in the split, what are you going to do? After the World Cup, he attacked a referee during a game was suspended for 18 months. So there's not really much entertaining the working class going on there. Although the referees would be a tool of the establishment, so it's probably some sort of class warfare. When he was 81, he played Anatoly Karpov at chess. (laughs) And they drew. It was a draw. Nice. I mean, he died a few weeks later. Had a game of see how many kick-ups Anatoly Karpov can do. He also starred in a comedy film called Seki Snima Patsy Say, because his nickname was Seki. It also starred the Yugoslav pop star Lola... Novakovic. And the band Sedmarica Mladi. It has an IMDb rating of 4.1, which is really low. 
It's surprisingly difficult to get below five on IMDb. The synopsis is, a group of young men suggest that the local tinsmith should make a film, and he agrees, but only if the director could be his cousin, soccer legend Seki. But Zeki thinks that filmmaking is the same thing as a football match, which causes many arguments among film crew members. What? This sounds awful. What? No, none of this makes sense. Go away. Also in the squad, Vladimir Durkovich, who in 1972 was mistakenly shot by the police. And Vlatko Markovic, who would go on to be the president of the Croatian FA, and once said, as long as I'm president, there will be no gay players. Thank goodness only healthy people play football. It's nice to see RFA aren't quite the worst. He died in 2013 and everyone cheered. (laughs) Chile featured the centre-back Humberto Cruz, who was nicknamed Cheetah. Wow. It's a good nickname for a footballer, isn't it? Yeah. Particularly a Chilean centre-half in 1962. But it's not because of any um, untoward behaviour. It's because he was nicknamed after Tarzan's chimp. In a game against Brazil, he once pulled down Pelé's shorts so that he couldn't run away. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so that happened in real life, and then the comedy film didn't have that in. Yeah. Afterwards, uh, Cruz and Pelé became good friends, apparently. Once you've seen another man's bum, that's how most (laughs) relationships start, isn't it? Friendships? how friendships begin. I mean, we're recording this over video conferencing software. We both have our bums out. (laughs) <laughs> so Grinch is playing in the final, but Novak, the defender, does a man-marking job on him. And the Czechs take the lead after 14 minutes. Masopust, who would go on to win the Ballon d'Or that year and manage Czechoslovakia in the 80s. But within two minutes, Brazil are level when Amarildo scores, beating the, until this point, excellent Schroif, the Czech goalkeeper in his third World Cup. He'd like been brilliant all tournament. Yeah, until uh, this game. In the second half, Jalma Santos clearly handballs, but no penalty is given. Jalma is in his third World Cup of four, and he's the first player to be in the team of the tournament three times. Only three players have done it. He's the first one. Who do you think the other two are? So it has to be someone who's been in a lot of World Cups and has played really well in all of them. Pele? Nope. Maradona? No. Two eight six ninety? No. No. I'll give you a clue. They're both German. Rudy Voller? No. <laughs> Rudy Voller, most famous German footballer. Beckenbauer. Beckenbauer is one. And the other one is more recent. Uh, closer. Nope. Philip Lahm. Uh, okay. Then in the final, Zito scores his first international goal for five years, and then Vava capitalises on another goalkeeping error by Schroif. Uh, have you seen it? The, yeah. He, he sort of goes to catch the ball, but it looks like he's doing some sort of ballet yeah. move. He claimed that the sun was in his eyes, and that's uh, why he sort of flapped around. And that makes it 3-1 to Brazil. And Brazil become the second and last team to retain the World Cup. There is a bit in the footage that you just don't see anymore, which is people jumping for joy. Arms outstretched, legs kicked up behind your knees. That sort of like, yeah. huzzah way that <laughs> I just don't think people do anymore. So Brazil are the world champions again. Their squad features Nilton Santos in defence. He's the oldest player at the World Cup. He's 37 years and 14 days. DD. It's his third World Cup as well. He nearly lost his right leg when he was 14 due to infection, but he recovered to, you know, win the World Cup twice. The midfielder Zito, in his honour, Santos used the letter Z on the captain's armband instead of C. He'd go on to discover Neymar. The lost continent of Neymar. Yeah. (laughs) Gilmar, the Brazilian goalkeeper, is the first and only goalkeeper to win two World Cups as a starter. His name, Gilmar, comes from his parents, Gilberto and Mary. In a sort of, what, what's your Gilmar name? It's the first three letters of your dad's name and then the first three letters of your mom's name stick together. So I would be Colsu. My parents are John and Jan, so I am Joe Jan. Joe Jan Cruyff, you could be. Hey, feel free to email us, worldcupofworldcups at gmail.com, with what your Gilmar name is. The top scorer at this World Cup is a tie. It is the first tie golden boot and is the lowest goals needed to win because it's six players who finish on four, which is frankly pathetic. Considering the last golden boot was won by Just Fontaine with 13, and they were like, whoa, it's going to take some beating to do that. So did they all get a bit of a golden boot or did they make three pairs of golden boots? I mean, there weren't. Oh, this is. Three golden boots. 
they went back and gave them the old ones. I mean, that. maybe they did. Maybe they did. There is another tie in 2010, but by then they bring in like assists and minutes played as a tiebreaker. But for this mm. one, it's just six people in first place with four. Yeah. So from Yugoslavia, there's Drazan Jerkovic, who'd gone to be the first manager of Croatia. From the Soviet Union, there's uh, Valentin Ivanov, who was uh, married to an Olympic gymnast and whose son was the referee at the Battle of Nuremberg in 2006. <laughs> sent off four and booked 16 there's Vava of Brazil he was nicknamed Peto de Acho which means steel chest oh can we add him to our golden boy that we're building <laughs> well, it's steel isn't it is that case? yeah I know but we've not had a chest we're, so far okay so this robot we're building he's the first player to score in two World Cup finals there's of Hungary Florian Albert who Wins the Ballon d'Or in 1967. He's voted the best young player at this World Cup. And Ferenc Varos Stadium is named after him. Of Chile, Leonor Sanchez, who punched at least two Italians in the Battle of Santiago and was voted number six in the Times' 50 hardest footballers in history vote. That sounds about right. He was beaten by John Giles, Willie Woodburn, Basil Bowley, Stuart Pearce and Anthony Goikache. I would not mess with Basil Bowley. Do you hear that, Basil? Basil? He won't. Yeah. He just won't no, mess with you. I won't do it, even if he did have a record with Chris Waddle. And the sixth, and probably the one who should have won the Golden Boot, because I think he definitely has the most assists, is Garincha, nicknamed Little Bird, because he was five foot seven. And laid eggs. Uh, also nicknamed Alegria de Povo, meaning the people's joy, and Anjo de Pernas Totas, meaning the bent-legged angel. I mean, technically, everyone's legs bend. That's what knees are for. But he was born with his right leg six centimetres shorter than his left, and his left turned out and his right turned in. However, Brazil never lost a game when both Pele and Garincha played. He's described by English journalists as Matthews Finney and a snake charmer all rolled into one. Playing a weird little pipe. Garincha was an alcoholic with a tendency for serious road accidents, including the one that killed his mother-in-law. He had eight daughters with his first wife and at least 14 children in total. No wonder he drank. He was the subject of the 1962 documentary Alegria de Povo, Hero of the Jungle, which has a 7 rating on IMDb, and a biopic made in 2003 called Garincha Estrella Solitaria, Lone Star, which has 5.2. There is also a documentary about him that claims that he is better than Pele. Well, based on 962, he yeah. is. This is the first World Cup to have a goal per game of less than three. Rubbish. It, it is 2.78. And from now on, only one World Cup will have a better goal per game than that. There were five nil nils, five one nils, and a dead rubber. So it's time now for us to work out where 1962 Chile stands in our pantheon of World Cups. The current leader is still Brazil 1950 with 7.04. Well, you did have a massive earthquake and that was devastating. So I think they should get quite a high score for that. And also angry mobs punching Argentinian journalists is always funny. Yugoslavia knocking out Uruguay. Italy not getting through. Spain not getting through, Argentina not getting through, and then Hungary losing to Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia getting to the final was a bit of a shock. Oh, yeah, okay. Goal of the tournament. Garinches uh, against England. I can't argue with a thunder bastard. Brazil. There was no one to touch them at this yeah. World Cup. They managed to do that without Pelé, essentially. Top scorer. I do like that it's spread between six people. I think that's quite nice. I don't think it's nice. I think it's indicative of one player not grabbing this well, tournament pulling line. their finger yeah. out yeah Grinch needed to score another couple of goals and then this would have been much higher awful I do not like it being a tie a tie between six people means that you've not tried hard enough exactly England did some stuff as a Scottish referee his name is Bobby Davison and his middle name is Holly so he was Bobby Holly Davison I mean that's the le- that's really the least amount of Scottish involvement you can have isn't it I mean, it got to the point when we were researching this that the only thing I knew about the 62 World Cup was the Italy-Chile game because it's just sort of almost a forgotten World Cup. There is fun stuff in there. It depends how much you like Italians being kicked. Brazil were a really good team and Garincha, but there wasn't much else beyond that. I can reveal that the score for the 1962 World Cup in Chile is 5.67. Ooh, where does that place it on our table? That puts it in fifth place. 
below Uruguay 1930. It's still better than France 1938 and Italy 1934. A little teaser for you, and I'll reveal the answer at the start of the next episode. In this World Cup, Vava became the first player to score in two World Cup finals. Can you name the other three players to have done it? I'll reveal the answer at the start of the next episode. Next time, it'll be the hardly ever talked about 1966 World Cup in England. Lucky old little England. There's a crime-solving dog, why Middlesbrough should be twinned with Pyongyang, and Azerbaijan's most famous man, as well as all the usual stuff you hear about 1966. We're not going to ignore that. So this has been the World Cup of World Cups podcast. I'm James Cook. I'm Paul Savage. Until next time, ta Bye. You can support this show by going to ko-fi.com slash World Cup of World Cups. I don't even know if that's how you pronounce it. Kofi? Kofi. K-O hyphen F-I. You can find Paul on Twitter at Comedy Savage and I am at James E. Cook. You can also email us at worldcupofworldcups at gmail.com. And this jaunty little number is Nutrocker by B. Bumble and the Stingers from 1962.